Hello and welcome to this special interview on The Wire. The past three weeks have been a tumultuous period for India-Pakistan relations, starting with the Pulwama attack on a CRPF convoy and then of course the Balakot airstrikes. Uh, we saw for the first time uh, a military confrontation that involved the use of air power between India and Pakistan and it seemed for at least a day or two as if India and Pakistan, the two countries, were set for a larger military confrontation. Fortunately, Sena Council seems to have prevailed, uh, both in India and Pakistan. We know also that external powers have played a role. Joining me to discuss the events of the past three weeks, what happened and their consequences is Shiv Shankar Menon, former National Security Advisor and of course former Foreign Secretary, somebody who's watched not just India-Pakistan relations closely, but has been a central figure in Indian foreign policy for the past decade and a half. Mr. Menon, let me start with um, Balakot itself. There's been a lively debate among politicians and among military analysts about what happened, the efficacy or the effectiveness of, of the uh, um, airstrike that India conducted. Um, any use of military power involves risks mm -hmm. and there is a, there is a payoff. Uh, in other words, a cost-benefit analysis is presumably made before a decision is taken to use, uh, 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 to, re to resort to military means. What, to your mind, as a former NSA and somebody who watches the um, relationship, what, to your mind, were the benefits or payoff from uh, the use of military power this time and uh, the, uh, the risks that are attendant on that? Well, I think there were some clear benefits. One is deterrence had clearly broken down. With Pulwama happening, the ceasefire had broken down across the line, there was shelling, there were various kinds, of, an escalation of violence generally, uh, much of it from the Pakistani side, or either prompted or directly by the Pakistanis themselves. So it was necessary to restore that. And I think the strikes on Balakot at least uh, forced a recalculus on a recalculation on the Pakistani side of the costs and of what we would be ready to do to prevent it, that we are prepared to do an airstrike that in itself is, uh, is an escalation on Pakistani territory against those who not only did but also professed to have hit us in Pulwama. J.E.M. Jesh actually claimed credit for this, so-called credit. So for me, therefore, it was necessary and the benefit really was there. I mean, there is a clear military and even a political benefit in changing the calculus and trying to restore deterrence. I think the risk, of course, is that any use of military force invites counterforce. One. Two, if you escalate the level of force, either in terms of what you use, where you use it, uh, you also invite escalation by the other side. And we saw that. Pakistan, the next day, did use air power to try and hit military targets in India. Uh, across the line on our side, which again was an escalation. Uh, but I think the risk of escalation, especially between two nuclear weapon states, I think unfortunately the way it's talked about and the rest of the world and it's certainly the academic community, the media maybe has, has a professional interest in it and therefore hypes it, I think it's exaggerated somewhat. Because these are rational people on both sides. It's not that the Pakistanis or we are suicidal. Nobody actually wants to raise it. And there's no automatic doomsday machine which takes you up the so-called escalation ladder. Uh, so it's not as though it naturally works. At each stage, there are decisions to be made by both sides. And both sides made the right decisions and actually wound it down. That doesn't mean it's over. Because it's not as though, here's an episode, problem solved, let's move on. Move on. No. I don't think anyone can guarantee that there won't be cross-border terrorism from Pakistan in the future. In fact, the incentives for that remain high. And one reason for that is because of the political uses to which it's been put. The more you beat the political drum and use it for political uses, the more the other side then has an interest in also using the same yeah. and doing it out. So you're, you've actually incentivized more attacks. That's one of the risks, I think. Thirdly, I think by the use of the military instrument, uh, you need to remember that it's only one of your potential tools of statecraft, that you have a whole range of things that you can use, mm. and that you are most successful when you actually use all of them together 
in a strategic coordinated fashion to achieve certain outcomes. Uh, but there again, you know, the moment, not everything needs to be done publicly, not everything has to be, in fact, should be done, because the more public you go, the more his, public, his incentives to also be seen to be reacting publicly. So it's, it's a calculus, as right. you said, right. between costs and benefits and where you choose to right. play it. If, if I What's been missing, yeah. though, I think in the last three weeks is uh, proper strategic communication with our own people, with our own. Every day there's a new story uh, ascribed to sources. And, you know, I mean, this kind of confusion and frankly on completely irrelevant issues, whether it was 300 or 50 or 20 people who got killed, that's not a measure of success. Right. Or the size of the holes in the roof. I mean, how is this relevant? Right. After all, you are trying to create an outcome. Right. So it's you measure against the outcomes that you, you have set for yourself. Um, I want to amplify uh, one part of what you said on the risk side, the, uh, the question of escalation. And if we set aside, and I think what you say is true, that the uh, international community and the media uh, makes, uh, you know, exaggerates the, the nuclear part, right? Although here I think Pakistan consciously played to that by convening a meeting of the National Advisory Council and, you know, uh, saying in so many words that you know what that means and so on, right? So they were playing to the gallery. But uh, I want to pick up on the uh, issue that you uh, have raised, which is of incentivizing uh, attacks on the other side. And the question of escalation, to my mind, is the following, that after the post-Uri surgical strikes, mm -hmm. uh, which were again, uh, you know, we were told, conducted along the LA LOC, so presumably not very deep ingress. Mm -hmm. uh, the assumption was that this was put paid to uh, uh, terrorism from across the border. A lot of uh, exaggerated claims were made about its effectiveness. Uh, th those surgical strikes did not stop what happened in Nagrota, did not stop what happened in Sanjuan, and they certainly did not stop what happened in Pulubama. Hence, you have escalated in terms of your response to um, an airstrike. Uh, if Pakistan-based groups, either acting at the behest of uh, the Pakistani establishment or even an ISIS kind of group, which um, is widely recognized not to be under the control of Pakistan, but nevertheless has an interest in stirring up the pot. Uh, if they were to uh, stage spectacular attacks in the hope of drawing an even more robust Indian military response, is that is that the kind of danger that you're hinting? Uh, uh, that possibility is always there, but you have the choice whether to respond. But politically way. you've talked yourself yeah. into an escalatory ladder not, in a way. Not necessarily. Yeah. I think you need to be clear in your own mind that you're not going to s get sucked into playing their game. You mentioned Pakistan, you know, always waving the nuclear card. Uh, that's because they want to internationalize this. I mean, they do feel <coughs> inferior to you and therefore they think if they can internationalize it and how do they get international attention? But by saying this is a nuclear flashpoint. It's a very dangerous situation. The world should get involved. They'd want to get the world involved. We haven't felt the need in the past. Uh, we, and so that makes a big difference. The same thing with whether we incentivize groups like this. <coughs> Frankly, groups like this, especially Jash and Lashkar at least, whatever they do happens within a certain envelope which is created for them by the Pakistani army and the ISI. I mean, they they don't attack Pakistan army and, or right. Pakistani targets. Right. There are certain things that they do and there are times when they have actually, you know, lowered the intensity of what they're doing when it suits their Pakistan. sponsors. Yes. So I, I don't think we should draw this distinction of some rogue organization. In fact, I have Afghan friends who tell me that ISIS is just another string to the ISI's bow. They, at least ISIS in Khorasan, right. which they face almost every day. So, I, I don't think we need to uh, start looking for individual sort of actors in this. I think we know where it's coming from. We know who enables it, supports it, and to a very large extent directs it. Right. So, the, so the risk in terms of relying exclusively or primarily on military means rather than treating that as one of many options then lies in locking yourself into a situation where the other exactly. side is then calling the shots. Also where you become predictable, right. you lose the initiative, right. where he can then make you do what he wants. Right. And I think that's something you need to be very conscious of, that your goal here is to create the outcomes that suit you, right. not the ones that he wants. Right. And the outcomes rather than, you know, statements and so on. Right. 
Um, uh, you were NSA uh, under the Manmohan Singh government, of course, from 2010 onwards. So, so you weren't necessarily in the hot seat after 2011, although you were foreign secretary and you were privy to uh, a lot of the meetings and discussions that took place. We know um, from what you've written in your book, which came out um, three years 2016. ago, 2016, um, and uh, uh, from you know uh, that that the government contemplated uh, military action or retaliation of some kind or the other. Uh, what were but then decided against it? What were the uh, factors that went into the calculus at that time? Well, I think the calculus was what happens if we do use overt military means. In any case, we were going to do a whole host of other things anyway. And what happens if we don't? It's not that by not doing it, we therefore achieved wonderful results. But by not doing it, we did allow other means to work. We did get our hands on all those who had either procured the equipment or organized the funding around the world. We got cooperation across the world. The moment we had done something overtly military, it would have become, oh, there they go again, the two of them fighting. And, you know, it's like the way adults react to children fighting. Nobody asks who started this. You just say, children, stop it. Yeah. And then it gives everybody else a chance to interfere, to start offer mediation. And that's exactly what we've seen this time around. Right. You have offers of mediation from the Chinese, from the Russians. The President Trump is saying you're going to hear good news very quickly. Right. You know, everybody gets involved. I mean, it's a chance for them, free chance, to look big and look as though they're doing something. Uh, ultimately, the decisions are yours and Pakistan's for your own relationship. But the Pakistanis want to drag them in, and I don't think we should go down that path at all. Yet in, in 2009, without the use of military, uh, or explicitly military uh, sort of threats we or intervention. We did get you were able to get cooperation years. from. Well, we got <coughs> cooperation, counterterrorism, cooperation around the world. More than that, we also did manage to a much greater extent to isolate Pakistan than, for instance, now. Today, Pakistan's situation is, international situation is actually much better than it was in 2008. And most important of all, we did get several years where there was no direct overt or directly traceable terrorist incidents in India that could be traced directly back to Pakistan for some years. And there was a diminution in, in terrorist violence right. for a few years. We stepped up our own efforts also, and that's as important, what we do internally to improve our own counterterrorism capabilities, to be at peace with our own people, whether it is in JNK or elsewhere with our own minority communities. That's very important what we do and to improve our own capabilities. We set up the NIA, did a whole host of things. Right. So, as I said, it's a range of things that you need to do. Yet, by the end of your tenure as NSA and the end of the Manmohan Singh government, uh, it, seems, it seemed as if that playbook had run its course in terms of uh, well, incre incremental gains. Uh, Pakistan was not, uh, you know, you had, you had a case registered against Lakhvi. The but they weren't started, going to they take were not, it very far. Exactly. I mean, that I think was clear. Yeah. They, after all, these are their agents. They're hardly going to act against them. Who else would ever work for them after that yeah. if they did act against their own agents? So uh, that, I think, was quite clear from the beginning. No, but I said in Choices, in the book yeah. in 2016, I said at that stage itself, if there were another incident, it was very unlikely that the government of India could react the same way as it did to 26-11 in 2008. And I, it was also clear to me that there, there was likely to be a military, and I think I said so in the book as well. Right. And, and I wrote that before URI happened, actually. Right. We've seen a rather complex um, international response mm -hmm. uh, to the current standoff. Um, the world, by and large, has not reacted negatively. To, uh, in fact, nobody has said that you, exactly. you did something wrong. Uh, I, mean, I mean, OIC kind of had a statement that you'd have... Uh, the OIC contact group right. meeting separately from the foreign ministers right. in Riyadh, I think, may have issued some kind of boilerplate language, which they've issued right. in the past. Right. I mean, no, not so much in Kashmir, but on in terms of violating Pakistani sovereignty and so on. But, but, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the broader world has uh, taken this in its stride. Has, did that surprise you? Um, no, not really. Not really. Because I think Pakistan's behavior, it's quite clear that, and everybody knows what Pakistan has done for so many years. And they've seen it, many of them have suffered it directly, whether it's the Americans in Afghanistan, or the Iranians, I mean, the, the Russians, even the Chinese know where some of the terrorists in Xinjiang have been trained and have come out of the Pakistani factories. So, 
Uh, I, I don't think that really surprised me. But the fact is that their willingness to actually do something about it is also limited. You mean the, the world at large? The life. rest of the world. Okay. Because ultimately they will take care of threats against themselves. And uh, the Pakistanis have been very careful with Jaish, with Lashkar, to make sure that they are threats mainly to you. And they, to keep them separate from the other groups which they use in other places. Right. Even though it was on the same day that we had Pulwama, the Iranians had an attack, right. the Afghans had attacks, all of them out of Pakistan. Yeah. Right. So I, I think the problem here is that you can count on the world to let you take care of your own security. I don't think you can count on the world to take care of it for you. Right. And that's something that you have to. Secondly, today Pakistan's position internationally, the Americans are trying to withdraw out of Afghanistan. They feel they need Pakistani brokerage in the talks that they're having with the Taliban in order to enable a, f a face saving exit. exit. So once they, they, they have a need, the Chinese commitment to Pakistan today is much more than it was in 2008 with CPEC, with their money, they have all, and because of the situation in Xinjiang, they therefore need the Pakistani cooperation. Uh, the Russians themselves have been selling weapons to Pakistan in the last year or so. So, you know, I think the international context for Pakistan has actually eased in a sense. So I think there are limits to what you can expect from the rest of the world yes, in terms of hard contributions to your actual security and your ability to deal with this. Right. We know that the United States has played a role in the past in um, helping to ameliorate tension, to put it mildly. Uh, Car at Cargill... Uh, every, every outside power will tell you that they carried messages and they helped to calm things down. Right. Ultimately though, these are, it's Pakistan and India, right. these two states who take the decisions. Right. We talk to everybody because we don't want them hearing only one side of the story right. or making mistakes in what they choose to do. So we will all talk to everybody right through these processes. And that's true every time. But the decisions are for India to take, for Pakistan to take. Uh, so I think there's a tendency to exaggerate the role that other people play. But Trump's announcement uh, out of Vietnam? You know, as I said, Just they, the he'd, I'm sure he'd the love spot, to, yeah. no, I'm sure he'd love to take the credit. He might believe it as well. That right. they've talked to both sides and both sides are saying, yes, they're willing to do this. So, you know, good thing we've managed to bring, bring it together. Right. But I think there is, you know, ultimately we have to remember who takes the decision. Right. And no matter how, how active the mediator is. And frankly, I'm not sure that this time you've seen the kind of active mediation you've seen in the past. Tashkent, for instance, or, you know, in, uh, when we did Parakram, for instance, there was a lot of toing and froing by the rest of the world. Uh, I don't think we're in that situation anymore. Right. And, and the Lavrov Qureshi conversation, the Russian offer, which the Chinese everybody, This is an opportunity for the rest right. of the world, right. for all professional diplomats everywhere. Right. Right. Um, uh, turning now to um, sort of where we go from here, Mr. Menon. Um, you had limited military engagement. Uh, it's too early to say de-escalation. I'm sure both air forces are still on high alert. It's not over yet. Exactly. Uh, and uh, we are in a situation where, you know, even minor incidents will generate headlines and in this politicized environment. I mean, yeah. MiG-21s have been crashing um, for a long time and incidents were typically relegated to a single para on an inside page. But now they're on the front now page. Now it's on the front page mm -hmm. because people then read meaning into this mm -hmm. or an attack on one person in JNK is now front page news. So we are in a rather brittle environment. Uh, how do you see things proceeding from here, uh, in the, let's say in the absence of a major incident, right? So you have a kind of current situation of tension, but no overt escalation. Uh, we know that uh, India and Pakistan are going to talk, are going to meet on the, at the Atari Wagga border to figure out the Kartarpur Sahib corridor. Uh, we have the simmering issue of Jadav, which is before the ICJ. I'm not sure what role diplomacy can play, but clearly it's not in the interest of the relationship that uh, this matter, you know, deteriorate to the point mm -hmm. where uh, the Pakistanis take some extreme step against him. Uh, and, um, you know, you, there is Imran Khan's offer. Uh, I'm not sure how expansive an offer it was, but mm -hmm. whether he was talking in the immediate context of let's figure out how to get Abhinandan back or a wider set of uh, engagements. But 
how do you think India should play its cards in the next four to six months? Let's, let's assume the elections are over and you have a new government in place or you have a government in place that has a majority. Uh, how do you go to, I mean you mentioned how there's a full range of steps that India has at its disposal. How do you see, uh, you know, what, what would be the optimum playbook uh, for us? For me, I think what we need to do is to increase our options vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Because I don't think it's reasonable to say that I will not do anything, I will not talk, I will not allow trade, I will not allow travel, allow anything, unless they stop all terrorism. Because that is most unlikely to happen. Right. And you've then thrown away all your other instruments. Right. And any means of pressure that you might have on different parts of Pakistan, on Pakistani civil society, on Pakistani business, none of whom, or even the civilian politicians, whose interests are not necessarily the same as those of the Pakistan army, the jihadi tenzims, and so on, who have an inbuilt interest in hostility to India. So I think we need to actually reactivate the various instruments you have. That doesn't mean we don't fight terrorism, that we don't get stronger in the way we deal with those who actually do us harm and mean us harm. I mean, I, th I think that is essential. And that, I don't think we should, s that doesn't mean, we but these are not exclusive. Right. These, these are not mutually exclusive. I mean, as of now, we're in, so we are you need to increase your options. Right. And the more you can do in that sense, I think, vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, the better the chance you have of creating a better outcome. But I'm not saying you have a solution. This is not an engineering problem. Mm. This is a political problem of process and it's, a lot of it is, in, is structural to the nature of Pakistan itself, which, you know, we're not in a, today in a position to change and we can't change that. So I think we must expect some level of cross-border terrorism, but we have to make it costly for them and de-incentivize them to the extent we can and add costs to their calculus, which we have done just now, and then see where we can go from there. But it's, as I keep saying, the Israelis have this very good phrase, mowing the grass, which you have to keep going back in rather than getting stuck in it. And I think that's something we'll have to do. Right. That's the attitude I think we need to adopt. Right. But I want to also say this is not the center of our lives. We have much more important things to do as India, and when you look at India's national security or foreign policy, um, this is a fairly unproductive exercise, frankly, India-Pakistan relations in terms of even if you settled everything and everything was wonderful, right. uh, I, I think there are better and bigger things that we, we as India should be doing. What are the key areas of focus that we've taken our eyes off as a result of this over the last year or two? I think the biggest shift has been if you look at the world economy and we really need, uh, we need the three big changes that you've seen seen a rise of China, you've seen a change therefore in China-US relations, you've seen a phased transformation in US foreign policy, and you've seen a huge change in the world economy to a low growth trajectory where it's fragmenting, where, and all three, you need to devise new solutions, you need to adapt your foreign and security policies to all three of these things. Uh, and I think, especially on the economic side, if you want to transform India, and if you want to go back to your earlier higher growth rates, I think you need to do something there. Right. I mean, the changes that you mentioned... But Pakistan is irrelevant to these, right. frankly. Right. I mean, the changes you mentioned uh, obviously create economic... I mean, they reflect diplomatic opportunities, but there's also great economic challenge. Uh, For me, these are opportunities down. more right. than challenges. Right. Actually, these are chances to actually go out there and do something right. which helps India. And, and yet India can't ignore or forget uh, Pakistan in terms of a threat. The years it? when Pakistan right. threw everything at you, including the kitchen sink, are the years when you did best right. as India. Right. If you think of it, through the late 80s, 90s and the early noughts, right. is really when India did best in transforming itself. Right. When you were most hopeful about the future, about being able to do the important things, abolish poverty, illiteracy, disease, etc. Those were the best years. So this is not strategic. It's, it's a strategic sorting distraction, right. sorting out your own the issues. Home front, exactly. Exactly, exactly. exactly. And um, since we did begin with Pakistan, and I, I know that <laughs> I know that you have a I mean, I just want to, the, uh, uh, you know, this is not a, a directly a Pakistan question, but somewhere down the line, um, you know, many people who watch JNK closely, uh, are of the opinion that uh, the, the domestic handling of the situation there 
is something which is also uh, you know contributed an unstable element uh, i think certainly pakistan when they see trouble in jnk they are incentivized to try and contribute to add to the trouble of course but they also think he has an opportunity for themselves right. i think they have been mistaken they have been proven mistaken every single time and this is the repeating mistake they made they made in 47 48 65 and so on and so forth but uh, 89 you know again but that's i think partly it's more important that we handle jnk properly and that we deal with our own people properly i think it's more important for ourselves not so much because of what pakistan may or may not do right. or what it enables pakistan to do but of what kind of india do we want right. and what kind of india are we building so for me that's something you should do anyway in your own interest right. Right. on that note mr manan thank you very much for joining us for this interview thank you thank you very much thanks to that yes. thanks to receive instant updates on all videos from the wire click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon pay to support independent journalism click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay